Welcome to the Break Vape Podcast. I am your host, Tammy Ernst. If you are an overwhelmed mom struggling to quit vaping after trying everything in your power to quit, then you are in the right place, mama. Each week on the show, we analyze stress, vaping, and addiction from a place of zero self-judgment so that you can build up the skills you need to ditch your vapes for good. Are you ready? Let's get to work. Hi, mamas. Welcome back to the podcast. I have another special treat for you this week, a conversation with the founder of the Tobacco Free in 33 movement, Stephen Barth. Stephen is a professor at the University of Houston, an attorney and an advocate for creating greater awareness around the dangers of smoking and vaping. This conversation was so informative and enlightening when we originally shared it on the podcast, so I knew I just had to share it again. So please enjoy. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Break Vape Podcast, Episode 24. I'm your host, Tammy Ernst. I hope everyone is doing fantastic. We have a really special episode today. I am joined with Stephen Barth. Hi, Stephen. Welcome. Can you tell everyone all about yourself? (laughs) Thanks, Tammy. Pleasure to be with you on the Break Vape Podcast. And yes, I'm a professor at the University of Houston in the Hilton College of Global Hospitality Leadership. I've been there a little over 30 years. I teach leadership and law as it relates to the hospitality industry, hotels, restaurants, meetings, events, travel risk mitigation, things like that. I do need to clarify, I'm here today uh, with my own perspective on things, not the universities. Uh, we always have to let people know that. And then I founded a, a, a small company called HospitalityLawyer.com. Think of us as Match.com for lawyers that want to represent the hotel and restaurant industry. Oh, that's interesting. And then we mm-hmm. started several years back a, a program called Tobacco Free in 33, where we try to create awareness of people that use tobacco and vape products to be more mindful about the impact of that behavior on the people and or pets around them. So are you talking about uh, generally like secondhand smoke when it comes to vaping? Second and third hand smoke when it comes, yeah, sorry, second and third hand vapor when it comes to vaping. You're exactly right. Well, let's get into that. That's, I think, a fascinating topic because there is so much... um, Just not a whole lot of knowledge around whether vapes are damaging when it comes to secondhand vape smoke. And from what I have read, it it leans towards that there is. And it kind of just makes common sense that if you're inhaling something that has, you know, 2,000 chemicals in it, and then you're exhaling it around a child or another person or an animal or something, that they're going to get some parts of those chemicals. So I would love to hear your take on it. Well, I think you're exactly right first. We, we don't have a lot of research, certainly like we have on the tobacco uh, dangers, but I think it's pretty clear, not just from a common sense perspective, which it certainly is, but I think the studies have shown so far a real significant impact on breathing capability. So asthma becomes more of an issue and uh, challenges in the just airways generally, and particularly when you think about children and or pets, right, that don't have the ability or the knowledge to move away from that, right? And I think the uh, very unfortunate thing is a lot of the people that vape that I have visited with, they're just adamant that it's just water, that they're expelling. Mm -hmm. But Tammy, from your work, you know differently. Absolutely. Yes. I I heard that um, quite a bit. People think that it's just water, water vapor, and that could not be further from the truth. It's usually packed with nicotine or CBD or THC. And that comes along with chemicals like diacetyl and vitamin E acetate and about 2,000 chemical compounds and heavy metals that are just shredding up your lungs and can lead to popcorn lung and a disease called e-valley, which I have a whole episode on, guys, if you want to go back and check that one out. So definitely vapes are not just water vapor. They are extremely harmful for you, extremely addictive, and harmful for the people around you. 
I think you're right, and, and that's why we created Tobacco Free in 33. We felt like there was kind of a void in the education aspect of people that vape and or smoke mm-hmm. to let them know, look, this, this, it, it just doesn't impact you. If you're doing it around children, if you're doing it around pets, if you're doing it in a car, if you're doing it in a space, like on an airplane, you are having a very negative effect on a lot of people in and around your life. And we just want people to take the time and stop and think about it. And hopefully, it's another reason that they'll want to go down the path that you're advocating, which is, hey, let's find a way to kind of smoothly move off of this, if that's possible. It's but, completely possible. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, so and, I, I teach people how to quit vaping without white knuckling it. <laughs> and we just get to the key core of addiction in the first place. Right. But it's interesting that you mentioned the airplane example because you and I had talked before and I have a friend who does not vape. She has never vaped, but she is aware that people vape in the bathrooms on airplanes. And it just really upset her that she knows that a, a chemical that she would not voluntarily inhale or take into her body is being recycled around an airplane and she can't do anything about it. No, she and, she's right to be upset about it. I know people that get enraged about it uh, because it's 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 an assault and what we call in the law a battery. It's the actual physical touching. So the assault is putting somebody in fear. The battery is the physical touching. And when you have to breathe in, remember, breathing is not voluntary, right? True. So we have to breathe. And so when somebody is so, I use the term selfish because they really are, they're putting their needs in front of everybody else's. And it's important that we remember because people say, well, I have the right to smoke and vape because it's my body. Fair. But as many justices in our legal realm in the United States have often said, one person's civil rights ends where another's begins. So if you smoke or vape, it's your absolute responsibility when you exercise that right that it does not encroach on anybody else's right, the right to breathe clean air and to not have those harmful chemicals in your body. So the airplane example is a great one of people. And of course, they're prohibited by law from doing it in the first place. Oh, yeah. And I think it's a, yeah. a risk of a $200,000 Fine. And my friends listening, if you're, you know, still struggling on your vaping journey or trying to quit, this is not coming from a judgmental place at all. I totally get it. I have been there with you. I know how tempting it is to vape in an area where you're not supposed to. So today we're just bringing a lot of education and awareness around the fact that it does impact other people. Yeah. And and I think that's a fair point. And I think it's a good one that we keep reminding people that we understand the power of this addiction. We're here to create mindfulness and to facilitate the the weaning off, as you said, in a very smooth way. But back to the airplane, just really quickly. In addition, the, if they if you're discovered, the U.S. Marshals are going to meet you when the plane lands. Oh, that's terrifying. Oh yeah, no, you're 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 coming off the plane. You're going to be charged with a federal crime. So oh, there's a no. lot of reasons not to. And now uh, there are some very they're rather expensive today, but they're getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper vapor monitors. I was curious about that because yeah. the current ones that we have in airplane restrooms, I think mostly pick up carbon monoxide and not so much vape smoke. Yeah. I could be totally wrong. I'm not totally sure about that. Uh, so don't don't go say, oh, I can vape in the bathroom. Tammy told me it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's not for all the reasons we've talked about. Plus, they're starting to put these monitors in, in the restrooms on planes. Plus, they're putting them in hotel rooms, which is another significant area of uh, abuse or violation of rules because most hotels today, certainly in the United States, are tobacco-free and vapor-free because the second and third hand tobacco smoke and vapor uh, or marijuana, it tends, it'll stay in the cushions, it'll get in the walls, the ceiling, the draperies, and it just never goes away. Oh, and that's really interesting with your background in hospitality. Yeah. So I would never imagine, can you expand more that these chemicals stay in fabric? 
Is that what you're saying on pillows and that's things like right. that? They do. What? They, they get a yeah. That's that that whenever it's it's the lit end of the burning cigarette or the expelled tobacco out of the lungs of the smoker or the vape of the vapor, and that it it doesn't just disappear. Now vapor does go away faster than tobacco. It doesn't linger as long, but both will get absorbed in the materials in the guest room, and they will also seep through the walls. They'll go through the ceiling, they'll go through the floor. We've got to remember our our, uh, eighth grade physics, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got gas, solids, and gases penetrate solids. So we know that, and that's why almost every hotel in the United States has gone away from allowing tobacco, and they... Sometimes. That's interesting. And yeah. there's a little side note here. I'm just having a visual in my mind. So I'm sure all of us have seen cigarette smoke and how it kind of lingers in the air for a couple of minutes. And as Stephen, as you were saying with vape smoke, it tends to go away quicker. However, for anyone who has seen uh Vapes that have CBD or THC, if you really look at that kind of smoke, that does tend to linger in the air as long as cigarette smoke, I would think. Probably so. I don't know the facts about that, but I would imagine from a common sense perspective, it does. And so, you know, so we you, you, you can that, probably guys. understand this secondhand smoke thing uh, better, but that when we talk about uh, you've probably gotten to a car where somebody says, well, I don't smoke in my car. But they smoke outside, it gets in their hair, their skin, their clothes, then they get in their car, and that residue is transferred into the upholstery, the carpet, and the ceiling. And so you might get into a car, somebody that says, well, I don't smoke in the car, but it still reeks of smoke. And it's the same thing with vapor. Now, if the vapor is not flavored, it's difficult to determine that by smell. But when you breathe... If you're sensitive to it, you can tell. Wow, I wouldn't have thought, I mean, it's just like an extra level, an extra layer of taking it. Because it would seem, you know, if somebody says, oh, I'm not going to smoke around you, I'm going to step outside, that's that, that's the end of it, Mm -hmm. nothing else to think about. But you're saying there's a whole other parameter to think about. Whole other parameter. So if you go outside and have a cigarette and you come in and hug your child, you're transferring that chemical residue to that child. And same thing with vapor. You know, you go outside to vape, but those chemicals, you've seen the clouds. I mm-hmm. like to use the analogy of pig pen on peanuts. Some of your viewers may, or your listeners may not be old enough to remember Charlie Brown and peanuts, but uh, uh, Snoopy, but they had a friend named pig pen and he was always had a swirl of dust around him. He was a messy one. He was the messy <laughs> one. And uh, he, he had that swirl of dust and that's, smoking and secondhand smoke and vape and vapor. And then the third hand, of course, is where it, it it's challenging. It gets transferred into these places. Yeah. Wow. So with Tobacco Free 33, what kind of awareness or methodology do you use? Do you uh, work with people one-on-one or do a uh, policy change or can you expand on that? It's a great question. and Thank you. Uh, So we do not work with people one-on-one. Our goal is to use a little humor and kindness Mm -hmm. to try to encourage people to be more mindful of uh, when they use these products. And we're hopeful in the long run that being more mindful of the impact that their behavior is having on others will encourage them to reach out to people like you for assistance in stopping completely because it it can wreak havoc on people's lives. I mentioned children previously. I mentioned pets. It can really have a very harmful effect on those. And of course, other people, if a parent smokes in a home, even as we talked about, if a parent goes outside and smokes or vapes, they come back in, they're bringing that second and third hand residue back into the home. So we like to encourage the users to be mindful that Tobacco smoke typically can drift, we know, at least 50 feet. Sometimes, if the wind is right, up to 100 feet. Vapor, not so much, but it still drifts. We know that, and it carries those harmful chemicals to where other people are breathing. And so that's one thing. But we also like to encourage non-users 
to be more mindful of the harm of second and third hand smoke. So, for instance, when you order an Uber Lyft, I don't want to call out, you know, just one, but any shared ride service that you request a non-smoking, non-vaping car and driver, right? And so that to let the companies know that this is important and we want this, we want to be mindful of our health and wellness when we're traveling or using your service. That would send a message. It just takes the numbers. I didn't even know that that is, is that an option? When you order a ride share to have a non-smoking or vaping driver? Such a good question. So there's a, after, as soon as you request the, they confirm the driver, they'll say, is there a note for the driver? And you click on that and you're able to put that note in very quickly. And I always say, please be a non-smoking, non-vaping car and driver. And sometimes they'll write back and say, well, I don't smoke or vape in the car. And I will say, please cancel because I'm very sensitive and I'd like to, you know, be sure I have a, you know, a healthy ride. And I find that more and more drivers are sensitive to that. I have, I've been pushing, uh, companies like Uber and Lyft to, disclose when their drivers vape or smoke, even if they don't do it in the car for the second hand things that we talked about. But I haven't been successful with that endeavor yet. But you know, Tammy, we can do this kind of mitigation from the non-user perspective also in things like when you have a housekeeping service or maintenance, uh, a repair person from whatever company that comes into your home, uh, uh, TV installation, whatever it is. If you're building a home, you don't want people that smoke to or vape to be inside your home building it because that just contaminates the air from the get-go. So I'm trying also to educate people of the, the ways they can con- focus on their wellness and health from the beginning and to gently request of these companies, please be sure the people that work in my home do not smoke or vape. And I find that more and more companies today are much more sensitive to that. Because Tammy, as you know, there's a big wellness kick out there going on, not just in our own homes for air quality since COVID, Mm -hmm. but also when we travel, more and more business travelers and companies are being very mindful of the wellness of their employees when they travel for work. And so they're really pushing hotels and airlines to make sure the air quality is as healthy as it can be. Sure. I think that wellness rolls into social responsibility. And thank goodness, this day and age, there's probably um, a, 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 the biggest focus we've seen on mental health. And uh, so much of addiction ties into that well as well. And it, it all wraps up into wellness. So how else do you... I'm going to say protect yourself on a daily basis. We are in Houston, Texas, which is a huge city. And we have smokers and vapors and pollution and all kinds of things. So you seem very sensitive to to smoke, secondhand smoke, vape smoke. So just about your daily routine, how do you go about protecting your body? It's a great question. I'm probably one of the few people that still wears a mask from time to time. I, mm-hmm. I don't as frequently as I used to. But certainly when I fly, I do. And I I know you said day to day, I do fly a lot. So I'm going to throw that in there. Okay. If I do take an Uber or Lyft, like I mentioned, I request the non-smoking, non-vaping driver. Anybody that comes into my home, uh, they, I ask them, I said, please be mindful of this. Uh, I live in a, uh, a high rise apartment that is totally tobacco and vapor free even at the pool areas and in the garage space. And they're very good about holding tenants and guests and delivery people accountable to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, There aren't a lot of those I discovered when I sold my home and I was looking for a place uh, that would do that, but they certainly did. So I think it, it starts with that. And the more people request, you know, tobacco and vapor free environment, then I think we're going to uh, see a bigger movement to protect the people's right to breathe clean air. People have to remember, 
And ladies and gentlemen, like I said, if you smoke or vape, I I understand why you do it. I understand that you feel like it's your right to do so, and I'm not suggesting it's not. But again, your right to smoke or vape ends where another person's civil rights began, and that's primarily the right to breathe fresh, clean, high-quality air. So we all have to be mindful and respect each other's rights. And that's one of the things I try, one of the things I try to share with people often is that, hey, uh, we need to think about this. So one of the reasons that it's difficult in an apartment area or shared housing with common walls, Tammy, is because people smoke or vape and they don't realize that it's going through the walls and it's impacting other people. It's just like loud music. Mm -hmm. That can intrude on people's lives as well and their civil rights to peaceful and quiet enjoyment of their home. And we have to realize that smoking and vaping is a similar intrusion. And I think the more people just request like you are and talk about it and ask for it, then the more people will get on board providing that kind of living space that, that you want or need. I haven't heard too much before about entire buildings that are smoke and vape free. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it's good. And, and they're because they're understanding one, the um, harmful impact that tobacco and vapor has just on their furniture, their carpet and their drapes like we talked about. So their maintenance costs go down. But also, you know, if you think about the United States, what do we have? About a 13 percent smoking and vaping rate. I, I could be off on that number, but I'm, it's pretty close. There's been a lot more vaping lately, right? So the number could be going up a little bit, sadly. But uh, you think about that. So if I have a building or if I have a hotel, well, 80, that means 87% of my customers don't smoke or vape. So we're kind of, if I'm allowing that to occur, I'm really letting the tail wag the dog, so to speak. So, you know, there's not a business out there in the world that doesn't want to please 87% of their customers. Right. And so that's what we try to share with them. And getting back to that point, we are not infringing on the rights of people that smoke or vape that we get it. You have the right to do that, but not when it negatively impacts other people. And so we are not infringing on your right to smoke or vape. What we're trying to do is protect the rights of the 87 percent of the people to breathe fresh air. And if you go to, we meant, we talked earlier, I traveled down to Colombia a lot and only 6% of the people in Colombia smoke. Uh, very few vape, more tourists come down there to vape, but it's a much different environment there and even easier to breathe and live day to day as you asked in a, mm-hmm. in a safe wellness type environment. And the, the vaping is everywhere. The smoking and vaping is everywhere. We were um, I was just showing Stephen actually the dashboard of this podcast before we jumped on the air and we were going through the list of countries where people are listening and we're up to 20 countries now all over the world where vaping has just become an epidemic. And uh, I, I would like to know if you, do you have any more insight on the physical negative effects of secondhand vape smoke? Well, I I wish I had more, but the research is still coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we do know, and I, I, I hope it doesn't take more than this, but we do know that it has a powerfully negative impact on people's ability to breathe. And I, I think I've learned from you the this the like popcorn lung. Did popcorn you, lung. Lung you told me about that, and it it's frightening. And I, you know, it's such a powerful addiction so quickly with, especially with the young kids, with the flavors and things like that. It is a wicked addiction. It happens extremely quickly and it is uh, the most powerful, worst thing I've ever had the displeasure of trying to quit. (laughs) And now I'm on the other side of it and know how to do it without white knuckling it. So I love to take other people there with me. Um, What else does Tobacco Free 33 
uh, do besides spreading awareness? Well, or you, what are some other ways that you do spread awareness? I'm just so interested in this. Sure, yeah. Well, this cause. Uh, you know, one of the things I was able to get involved in, and that kind of was the precursor to Tobacco Free in '33, was to in, gently encourage the city of Houston and other cities where I've traveled uh, that didn't have significant. Uh, tobacco-free ordinances, trying to educate them about the negative impact of second and third-hand smoke and vape. So you'll notice that the the Houston uh, has expanded their tobacco ordinance in the last several years to include vaping. Anywhere smoking is prohibited, vaping is also prohibited. Mm-hmm. I've seen those signs start to yeah. pop up in the last couple of years. Popping up. We, we just, uh, I was involved in a group effort at the University of Houston to make our main campus totally tobacco and vapor free. So that's another area that I try to participate in on the policy side. It's one thing to have policies, though, Tammy. It's another. You have to enforce those policies gently, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's important to create awareness of those policies, whether it's in the city or on the campus. So we, we're working hard to do that. And then I'm trying now, uh, my next initiative is to try to get Houston and or the entire state of Texas, although it's a little difficult right now with the political environment, to make the entire state tobacco-free uh, and vapor-free in you know places of public accommodation. Uh, and But I'm starting, at least trying to, here in Houston with patios of restaurants uh, for the sake mainly of the employees, but also their customers. Yeah. It's unfortunate that people will go up. This is one of the things we do at TF33, Tobacco Free and 33. So we try to educate people that, hey, when you light that cigarette up one table away, other people are going to have to breathe that smoke in. It's Mm -hmm. not just you. So be mindful of that. No, or, vape, or vapor, for that matter. And vapes, yeah. And it all starts with awareness. It does. So that's it's kind of our primary goal. I have a, a grandson. He's actually a French bulldog. <laughs> His name is Franklin. It's my daughter's French bulldog. And we kind of made him a star on our Instagram with, uh, with Tobacco Free and 33 because he's featured prominently in all of our memes about tobacco. And we also translated into Spanish uh, all of our memes. So we, we've it's been a little slow going, as you might imagine, but we're slowly but surely building and getting an audience. Oh, that's fantastic. We have such a large Spanish-speaking community. And I guess rolling in the dog is where the humor comes in with the memes. It's what we try <laughs> to do. We think people I'm would glad. much rather listen to a dog than to me. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I'm so glad that you can do that because on this podcast, you know, it's always awareness and strategy about how to quit vaping. And it's not necessarily like the most ha-ha fun topic right. to to bring about. And I like to joke and I like to have fun. So it's really nice that we can bring some humor into the podcast. Yeah, I think it's fun. Tell me something, though, if you don't mind. So you are an absolute expert when it comes to cessation of vaping, right? I've seen your work. I've seen your program. It's very cool. Thank you. Uh, Is that like, is stopping vaping like stopping other addictions? In other words, is the willingness to accept that you have an addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs, or in my case, sugar, uh, is it, is caffeine. It, yeah, ca- yeah, yeah. My students will say, "I'm not addicted to anything, really." Ha- you like coffee every day, every day, three, four times a day. How long have you been doing that? Five years. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've got some addiction issues. But have you have you determined that that's one of the first steps, like it is with alcohol or drugs or sugar, that you have to own it? That okay, I'm addicted. And I need help getting off it. Absolutely, 100%. And the first step to that is awareness, especially when it comes to uh, a lot of our youth. And, you know, we were talking earlier about the general consensus that vaping just isn't bad for you or it's not as bad as cigarettes, which is completely false. 
And so it just starts with that awareness of, no, it is really, really harmful for you, for the environment, for the people around you. This is the, the list of ways. And then if, if somebody, I'm coming from the approach of maybe someone who is saying that, you know, they, they don't have an addiction and vaping is not that bad. Well, when we really start to study it and get very, very curious about why they're vaping in the first place, then we can take that aspect of addiction literally kind of take it out of your brain like a ping pong ball and set it on a table and analyze it and study it. And from there, we we get to the root of why we have this addiction in the first place. And probably the biggest real the biggest reason for how addictions are created is a your primal brain just wants dopamine. It wants dopamine hits. It doesn't care how you get dopamine or where you get dopamine or that the way that you're getting it could be very bad for you. So any addiction in that sense could be over social media, could be vaping, could be smoking, could be drinking, over exercising, overworking, whatever your brain is doing that is detrimental to itself to get that dopamine hit. It's what it's going to do because it's geared to seek pleasure, avoid pain and be efficient. And so you've got to get very curious about it and use your frontal lobe, your prefrontal cortex brain to really think about addiction and study it and analyze it. And from there, we can really get to the bottom of, of why somebody got addicted in the first place. And a lot of the time in the life coaching industry, we call this buffering. Um, buffering is just when you're doing something to avoid feeling a negative emotion. I see. Okay. So, and a lot of times vaping starts out as fun. It did for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was just at a very fun festival called, you probably know if, it, if you're here from Houston, it's called the Renaissance Festival. I am, yeah. It's a lot of fun. And I was camping out with friends. And I had really earlier on in life, um, like late high school, early college, I had smoked cigarettes and I had quit. And then I didn't smoke for years and years and years. And I was at this festival and someone handed me a vape that evening. And, you know, we went on, had a great night. And in the morning, the vape was still in my hand and it stayed there for years And it got to the point where there was no little buzz anymore. It was not fun. It was setting a bad example for others around me. It was causing me to do things that society said you're not allowed to do. And it just became a really big problem. It it does. And, you know, I've heard, Tammy, that one of the challenges with vaping is with a cigarette. You smoke a cigarette and then you go back in and you work for two or three hours. Mm -hmm. But the vaping... It's always there. It's always there. It's so convenient, yeah. which is why I think it is so much harder to quit than cigarettes and worse for you than cigarettes because, A, you have so many chemicals and so much nicotine that's packed into one vape. And then you have the aspect that it's so convenient and it usually smells really nice and it looks cute and it looks fun. It has lights. I mean, it's all marketed to our faces. Sure. To be that way. So I always tell people when I'm working with them and everybody on this podcast that if you're addicted to vaping, it's not your fault. I mean, it is your choice to vape or not. However, if you have a vape and maybe you're looking at it right now, you are looking at a multi-billion dollar addiction that was designed to get you hooked and keep you hooked on vapes. Because they want your money. Because they want your money. And big tobacco is a multi-billion dollar industry. Let's talk about the money for a minute because I, I'm, I'm interested in this. Sure. It's expensive. Mm-hmm. Have you done the math? How much does it cost for somebody to vape on an annual, just a moderate vapor? I have done the math with a lot of people and it varies. The very, very lowest amount I have ever seen was from um, a single mom who did not have a high paying job who uh, was was really struggling, and she was still averaging $1,800 a year on vaping products. And then you take someone who can afford it more than than that, and it just goes up from there. I mean, I, I had somebody average out what they had spent in five years on vapes, and it was like $25,000. In five years? In five years. 
yeah. ladies and gentlemen, if if you if you took that money and put it into a savings account, especially today with four and a half percent T bill interest or just a CD, and if you started that, if you're twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, even if you're thirty or forty, that's your retirement fund, and it's mm-hmm. going to be many hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time you retire due to compounding of interest. So another reason. If it's not, if your health isn't enough, your financial uh, success and stability and security is at risk when you put this money in the pockets of big tobacco and vaping companies. Tammy, that's fascinating. I didn't know those numbers. Those are big numbers. I didn't realize vaping was that expensive. It's it's extremely expensive, and um, so that's. One, I actually on the podcast before. I think I have I have an episode you guys called "Show Me the Money." I'll oh, ha- I'll have great to. Name. Great I can name. look it up and see exactly what episode that is. And on that episode, I asked everybody to go through and add up what they've been spending on vapes a day, a week, a month, a year, five years, and I believe ten years. And the numbers I got back were just astonishing. Wow! And these are this is this is research straight from the people that are spending it. Yes, this re- this is straight from the listeners of this podcast yeah. who um, are all over the world and who emailed in their their unique answers because everybody's different. Sure. I'm going to look up that episode number real quick too it, because it, it, I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's a good practice for everyone to do. Look it up. It would be interesting to see the uh, comparison between what people spend on tobacco products versus what they spend on vaping products. Uh, I don't know if that has, I'm sure it's been done. I don't know, but uh, I I would be interested to know if it's as costly as tobacco. That's um, kind of a hard one to guess at simply because with tobacco, you have well, I guess you could break it up into dip or snuff or cigarettes. Oh, good point. When you're using tobacco, and then also when you're using vapes, you can break it up into nicotine vapes, zero nick vapes, actually, which I do not recommend. Oh. Um, THC vapes and CBD. So you kind of have different areas. And you can go from uh, a handheld little disposable vape, which are usually like 20 something dollars or, you know, a big device that you charge and fill with your own e-liquid. So there's a lot of different variables. It's, it's a little bit more complex than just buying a pack of cigarettes. So show me the money, you guys. I just looked it up. It was episode 11 and that was back on uh, January of 2023. So if you haven't done that exercise, go ahead and go back and take a, take a listen to that one and add up how much you've been spending on vapes. And then like Steven said, there is a better way to invest that money. Much better way. You know, Tammy, it gets back to uh, <clears throat> habits. Life is all about habits and mm, we have good absolutely. habits or we have not so good habits. And as Tammy mentioned previously, uh, you know, it, we understand it's not your fault, but our choices to continue or to not seek help, uh, we have to take responsibility for that. Absolutely. And Tammy has given you a path to uh, shift that not so good behavior habit into better habits. Like instead of spending money on that, that can be harmful, not just to you, but your children, your pets, others around you then um, you can put that money in a savings account and uh, have a much better life going forward that's much healthier for yourself. For sure. And I'm glad that you mentioned habits, actually, (laughs) because the way that my my one-to-one coaching program works is I meet with clients twice a week for four weeks, and we go through eight sessions that are all laid out that I have proven to get people to quit vaping. And then we really crack it down and specifically and uniquely work with each person in their life. And I do that because on average, it takes 21 days to create a new habit. So I like to keep people with me for an entire month. And I'm always texting them and encouraging them. I mean, it's very, you know, very unique and very helpful um, because when you're quitting tobacco, it is, uh, what, 72 hours to get nicotine out of your system. 
Oh, is that the shelf life of tobacco? Mm-hmm. Seventy-two hours. Okay. That is yes. the The physical <clears throat> timeline that nicotine will stay in your body is seventy-two hours. So that's about three days. So after that, everything else is a mental addiction and it is breaking habits and creating new ones. And when we get into the the brain psychology of it, which is my favorite fun part, you know, when you're building new habits, you're literally creating new neural pathways in your brain and you're creating evidence for yourself that you can live a vape-free life. So the work we do is really neat. And a lot of it, you know, we're, we build new habits. See, I think that's great. I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey's book, even though it's 50 years old now, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Oh, yeah, and, that's a good uh, one. Nowhere in the book does he talk, does he think smoking or vaping, he doesn't <laughs> mention smoking or vaping, as one of those top seven habits. So that should tell us something. No, it's not. And Stephen, I really <clears throat> am so appreciative for the great work that you're doing in the world because another aspect of smoking and vaping and any addiction, so, you know, you and I were talking more about the, the physical effects of secondhand smoke. I'd like to talk for a minute about the mental effects of modeling that behavior to our younger generation. Yeah, it's... it's. I'm a big believer that almost all human behavior is modeled to us, and it's modeled in a way to where we can either do exactly what we've seen other people do or decide that we are going to do the opposite of that and not be the kind of person that modeled specific behaviors to us. So modeling is such a big, big deal, especially when it comes to kids and secondhand smoke. You know, they they will see somebody vaping or smoking and normalize it. That's their normal. I think you're right on target there, Tammy. And we don't have to look further to know that's true than when we see what's going on in the world today, and especially in the United States with the high levels of hate mm. and hate crimes that we're seeing. You know, people aren't born hating, right? They learn that. Oh, I agree. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So right. quick story on that. I grew up in the inner city schools going here yeah. <clears throat> in, in Houston. Absolutely. And I think if you take a, a room full of little kids and little babies and they're all different colors, they're all going to play with each other. Just like when I was in elementary school, we all got along. We all played together. And I just think that, you know, going on the side tangent here, but I believe that, you know, that kind of hatred and behavior is definitely modeled and shown to us through example. It is. The good news, I think, from that is that if it's learned, hopefully it can be unlearned. But as you know, working with the addiction of vaping, it's a challenging process to unlearn it and to because it's been modeled for you your entire uh, young life. Mm -hmm. And we tend to model our parents' behavior and our friends, our peers' behavior. And so to your point about smoking and vaping, we do see that a lot, and it's, it's, it's a problem for us, and people need to realize that they're not just, like we talked about throughout today, it's not just themselves that they're creating this harm for. It's the people in their realm as well, because they're seeing that behavior, especially the younger, impressionable people. And if you act like it's cool or you think it's cool and they're going to see that and they're going to think it's cool. Think about the Marlboro Man. Oh, yes. Think about and Joe Camel. Joe Camel. Remember Joe Camel for, for you kids, guys? Right. Yeah, guys, if you don't know who Joe Camel is, Camel Cigarettes used to have a cartoon character called Joe Camel, and the tobacco industry got in some trouble because they were purposefully marketing this cartoon character to children. And the company Jewel has gotten into buku lawsuits for doing the basically the same thing, but in today's day and age where they were specifically marketing online tactics to our youth. And that's a whole nother episode. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. You know, the that's other... <laughs> a whole nother tangent to get me started on big tobacco. <laughs> well, the other thing they're doing, Tammy, is you're in all the streaming services and a lot of the new content in the streaming services like Netflix, Amazon Prime. You're, you know, in the period pieces, the historical pieces, you'll still see cigarettes, unfortunately, because they're trying to make them, quote unquote, realistic. But what you're also seeing in the more modern day settings are 
people vaping. Oh, yeah. Even and pop culture. That, yeah. Even people that are pregnant that are vaping. And I have no doubt. I do not have evidence of this. But in my mind, I have no doubt that the vaping companies are uh, paying to get their products in those uh, episodes. My feeling is that's what tobacco did. Yeah, me. I wouldn't doubt it. And um, vaping is in pop culture. It, it has no business being there, right. influencing our kids. And you mentioned uh, someone that's pregnant. It it breaks my heart because I am in so many social media groups where I'm watching people try to quit. And there was one story. She was a mom and she's pregnant and she's trying to quit and she just can't. And so I'm giving her all this advice. But it and that is how strong this addiction is. It is it's completely doable to quit. It's 200 percent doable, and you're 100 percent worthy of quitting. But it is a process, and it takes some time. And then back to the modeling real quick. I guess I would never, um, I'm just wondering, when it came to cigarettes back in the beginning, I think a lot of people really didn't know yet. We didn't have the scientific evidence of how bad it is for you. So I grew up in a family where my grandparents would smoke cigarettes in front of me as a little kid, and I liked the smell. I actually did, like right when the cigarette was first lit. I can remember being like four or five, six years old and enjoying that smell. So come to wonder why I started smoking cigarettes later on. You know, it's the same thing with vaping. But now we know, guys, right? We're spreading awareness and from a loving place, not from a judgmental place. But we know that modeling vaping and doing it around others is perpetuating a really unhealthy habit and an addiction. I think you're absolutely right about that. Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It's the key. It is. And there's, you know, another little opinion I have about vaping too is when you're modeling your behavior to other kids, even, or to little kids. Um, and I was guilty of this too, guys. I'm a mom. I used to vape in front of my daughter. And looking back, I'm just, oh, how could you have done that? But when you're addicted to it, you will make any excuse to keep doing it. True. And I have a theory that if you are addicted to vaping, smoking or anything else, even if you're not modeling that addiction in front of a child, you still kind of are. They might not see you do it, but they're getting the version of you that is displaying stress and anxiety that you have from that addiction. I think that's a very good point. They see you go outside. They see the anxiety before you go. They see you come back in. They see that, that behavior. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they think it's absolutely okay. Yeah. And back when I was vaping, and I would know, I would say, oh, you know, I really shouldn't do this in front of my daughter. But she's so little, she's probably not going to remember. And I thought, you know, the one reason that kept me addicted to vaping is I thought it helped with stress and anxiety. And I would think, wow. oh, I'm stressed out. I should vape. And then come to find out nicotine does that entire dopamine hijack in your brain. And there's just so many other reasons that vaping causes stress and anxiety. And I just, you know, I really wanted to safeguard my own happiness and not choose to do something that is going to stress me out. So I think um, another big part of the work that, that I focus on with people is how to quit vaping so that we can manage stress and anxiety in a healthy way without the crutch of an addiction. Yeah. And, and for your listeners, I would encourage you if you're, if you are using that because you do think it's managing stress and anxiety, there are other healthier ways to do that. As Tammy just said, short bursts of meditation can really help. Understanding emotional intelligence, which is all about self-awareness, self-regulation, can really help you. And, uh, of course, a big part of emotional intelligence, Tammy, is empathy, understanding the impact of your behavior on others. Absolutely. But, and I'm yeah. excited to get into this because, you guys, Stephen has an entire book on emotional intelligence. Can you tell us about that? Well, to be fair, there are lots of people that have written extensively about emotional intelligence. Uh, and so what I did is I took what I felt like were the practical aspects of emotional intelligence and 
put it into an, an ebook uh, called Intelligent Emotions, right? Because I, I do think it's important that we all be mindful of our emotions and the impact that they have, not just on us, but on others. And of course, with the caveat, Tammy, I wrote that book when I began teaching about emotional intelligence because I've learned in my life that we teach what we need to learn the most. <laughs> oh, yes, 100%. <laughs> so uh, I was very fortunate. As a matter of fact, uh, my nieces and nephews, uh, sometimes when we sit around at Thanksgiving, they'll all say, hey, if there was one thing you could have done earlier in your life that you think would have made an impact, what would it have been? And, you know, my my brothers might say, save, you know, save more money or not borrow that money, right? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, But I quickly say, uh, I wish I would have learned about emotional intelligence when I was in my teens and 20s. It would have made an enormous impact. I'm a, I actually tell my audiences when I speak that <clears throat> this has the power uh, to change your destiny, and it really does. And so it's all about self-awareness, self-regulation. It's all about uh, empathy, and it's all about using your emotions in a different way, and then also reading the emotions of others. Just a quick example. If you're driving down the freeway and somebody cuts you off, right, what's your first reaction? No sign language, please. Because <laughs> right? if you drive in Houston, you deserve combat pay. There's no question about it. But Yeah, uh, you have to be an aggressive driver to get anywhere in this city. I would say your first reaction is to be irritated. We get irritated, but why? Yeah. So this is a person we've never met before. We're never going to meet them again unless we chase them down, which we don't want to do. No. Right? <laughs> but we, if we don't react, you see, that's the key. If we do react, we've let this unknown person knock us off our peace and productivity. If we don't react and we just continue on down with our day, what happened? Nothing happened because it's our reaction that gives significance to the events in our lives. I agree 100%. In fact, I was uh, watching some of your videos on YouTube. So you guys, Stephen has a presence online. He has some uh, YouTube videos that you can watch about emotional intelligence. And there was one that just made such great sense. And I believe you were asking, you were speaking in front of a large audience, and you were asking them if anyone actually has the power to make you angry. Did I misword that or? Oh, you said it exactly right. Does anyone have the power to make you angry? And half the audience typically will say yes, because mm -hmm. they're, they're, they get road rage, they mm -hmm. get angry, uh, or the computer, they get frustrated and they beat up their computer. But no, nobody has the power to make us angry or frustrated unless we let them. I believe the verbiage that you used, which I think is incredible, really resonates with me, is people have the ability to create a circumstance in which you can react to. Right. Can you expand on that? Yeah. This is, yeah they'll create circumstances. They'll create those, those um, aspects where they cut you off on the freeway or they'll yell and scream. Or in my case, they'll smoke around me. Mm -hmm. Right? That's my trigger. And I have to remind myself. Look, slow down, don't react, right? Go on down the road. You're focusing on tobacco free in 33 to make your impact, right? It's like driving. You are not going to teach other people how to drive by flipping them off or yelling and screaming at them. If it's that important to you, you need to join the highway patrol. <laughs> right? Because then you could have that impact. But yep. you're, you, the best thing you can do is to learn to not react to those circumstances. And because if we don't react, nothing happened. And that's, I found that to be extraordinarily powerful. And that's another way to reduce that angst and that stress so you don't feel the need for that vape or that cigarette is by just reminding yourself, this person can't impact you unless you let them. 
And it's whether or not if somebody calls you a bad name or if somebody criticizes you, it's all the same. But you have to establish that initial foundation for yourself that you believe in yourself. And that takes work. Oh, I was just thinking that. I was just about to tell everybody that is a skill. (laughs) Emotional intelligence is a skill that we are not often taught as a broad society. We are taught to escape our feelings, not pay any attention to them, to buffer, which leads to addiction. And it's a very rare skill when we are blessed to have someone in our lives that will teach us how to feel our feelings and how to manage our emotions and how to take responsibility for emotional intelligence. It's absolutely a skill. And when you first start learning it, it is like going to the gym for the first time. It's a very good way to put it. You know, a lot of people, Tammy, think, well, emotional intelligence is becoming an emotional robot, not feeling your feelings. But you are exactly. Oh, it's the opposite. It is the opposite. And it's a skill, guys. I've had to do this work on myself, and I'm not perfect by any means. I'm always a work in progress. And that's just part of the humility. It's just part of the deal. That's exactly right. I live it and teach it and breathe it every day. And I still have my moments. Uh, But I continue down the path because I'm absolutely convinced it is one of the healthiest lifestyles I have ever found. Well, and there's so much good to come from that and and the work that you're doing and helping others. Thank you. We're trying. (laughs) Well, it's been so great to talk to you. Is there anything else you want to add to uh, to the podcast today? Tammy, this has been wonderful. I've learned a lot. And uh, I want to thank you for the great work you're doing. If with your permission, I'd like to put your information out on the Tobacco Free and 33 website and on stephenbarth.com uh, so that we can let people know about this terrific resource and help they can get to stop vaping. Oh, thank you. Sure. I would be happy to. And I just want to tell everybody again, um, Stephen has this ebook. I was just reading it last night. It's very interesting. Intelligent emotions on self-responsibility, owning our emotional power and changing our reactions. And then he also has Tobacco Free and 33. Can you please tell everybody where they can find you and how they can get a hold of you? Sure. Uh, Today, it's fairly ubiquitous out there on the web, uh, but you can just Google Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Barth, B-A-R-T-H, and I'll pop up. uh, And then you can find me and send a message at stephenbarth.com or hospitalitylawyer.com would be the two primary places. They both have contact forms, and you feel free to send us a note there and uh, we'll respond. We'll look forward to hearing from you. Fantastic. And guys, if anybody wants to reach out to me for coaching, I really hope you do. Last episode, I was telling you guys that the podcast is all around the world now, and I have you guys emailing in from all over, and every time I see one, it lights me up from a place of service. I'm so glad that I can help you guys become the person that you want to be living a vape-free life and time zones and uh, currency exchange doesn't really seem to have any effect on it. So I think it's fantastic. You guys, please email in. That's hello at breakvapes.com. Once again, that's hello at breakvapes with an S.com. I hope you guys all have a fantastic rest of your week. Stephen, thank you again so very much for coming on the show. And I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in today. If you like what was offered in today's show and want even more support, head over to www.breakvapes.com and schedule your free strategy session to discover exactly how my proven system can help you ditch your vapes for good. Bye for now.